So until now, we focused on the analog uh, MOSFET in active mode or sometimes called saturation mode. But uh, we're very often in analog design going to use the MOSFET as a switch. So we're going to consider next its modeling uh, as a switch. So um, when we use the transistor as a switch, it means that we're using it in one of two modes. Either the transistor's off or it's in triode region or it's linear region. Remember that when uh, the channel is inverted and a small drain source voltage is applied, the transistor's in triode and um, we end up with a channel cross-sectional area that depends on the gate overdrive voltage. Um, and we have a linear dependence between current and drain source voltage applied. Um, we do, in such cases, have a gate capacitance that is really straightforwardly determined by the parallel plate capacitance formed between the gate and the inverted channel region. Um, and so that can be estimated just by multiplying the area of the gate, W times L, times the specific capacitance of gates in a given technology. That constant C aux in turn depends on the dielectric constant of silicon dioxide shown up here and the thickness of the um, insulating gate insulating layer. layer. Now, there would be other terms as well that, uh, that capture overlap between the gate and source or drain regions, as well as parasitics due to nearby metal layers, contacts to gates, drains, and sources, and, uh, and so on. That should be considered as well. So here's what... Um, a more complete small signal high frequency model of uh, a triode MOSFET. So you've uh, in reality got a, a drain to source resistance. This is the channel, the inverted channel resistance. usually referred to as RDS. And the reality is there's a sort of capacitance between that channel region and the substrate of the integrated circuit or body terminal below, and between the channel region and the gate uh, above on the top side that is distributed across the length of the channel. Uh, however, we usually just take a sort of first order model and we, you know, rather than consider a distributed capacitance here, we just model all the resistance as a lumped resistor RDS, and then take that capacitance and sort of split it equally between the gate and uh, the drain regions. So uh, each of CGS and CGD is equal to a half of the total gate capacitance. So here's the term half, and then the gate area times C aux is the sort of total gate capacitance. And again, here we split that capacitance in half because when it's operating in triode, physically the structure is very symmetric. There's no big asymmetry created by large drain source voltages as there is when the transistor's in active mode. So uh, it makes sense that we just split the capacitance equally between the two terminals. We still have the parasitic junction capacitances associated with the source and drain. Those are very much as before. They depend on the reverse bias voltage across those PN junctions and also depend on the area and perimeter of those junctions uh, as before. Um, the resistance of the channel uh, depends on the effective gate source voltage uh, as described earlier. Now, the other uh, operating state of the MOSFET when we're using it as a switch is just when it's off. When it's off, there's no there's no inverted channel region, so there's no conductive DC conducting path between drain and source. But we still have uh, capacitances as between the gate and the source and drain regions. But since the channel is inverted, these are now primarily the so-called overlap capacitances or parasitics associated with metal contacts and so on. 
um, the capacitance to the channel, the action between the gate and the actual inverted channel region is no longer there because the channel is not inverted. Instead, we have some capacitance between the gate and the body region uh, directly because now uh, it's for an NMOS transistor still p-type. But that capacitance is typically less, uh, somewhat less than what you see when the channel is inverted. Uh, and that's because there's still likely to be a depleted layer on the surface of the semiconductor just before, just below the gate insulator. So effectively the, um, the dielectric thickness of this capacitance is, is more than just the thickness of the gate oxide. Now, this simple model here doesn't include leakage currents, which uh, can be important and we'll talk about later. Um, and uh, another important point to note is that in very short channel devices, uh, very short channel length causes the source and drain to be in very, very close proximity. And so you can have additional capacitances directly between drain and source that need to be taken into account. So now let's just review some of the non-idealities when using the MOSFET as a switch that aren't captured by the simple models we've shown so far. We've already talked about how as VDS increases, the drain uh, current to VDS relationship deviates from a linear one. Um, so this uh, no longer looks like a resistor. It looks like some sort of nonlinear resistor. That can be an important non-ideality uh, for circuits where linearity is important. You've also got feed through of whatever signal may be arising uh, on the gate to the drain and source. So when there are transient signals, fast changes in the voltage on the gate due to the capacitances between gate and drain and source, um, you know, the voltages at the drain and source must temporarily change along with the gate voltage. Um, those capacitor, the voltages on those capacitances can't change instantaneously. So a classic example is when there's a clock uh, on the gate, and that's a common situation that clock voltage uh, will change abruptly from one state to another and it may bring the source and drain nodes uh, along with it so that can be considered a kind of a feed through of the clock to the source and drain um, similarly because there are parasitic capacitances directly between drain and source and, and there's also a capacitive path if you like comprising two series capacitors between drain and source through the gate, um, that can cause there to be feed through from the drain to the source, even when the transistor is not inverted. That is even when the transistor is off. Um, AC signals can effectively pass from drain to source through these parasitic capacitances. And um, then finally, you know, anytime we turn the transistor on or off, um, the uh, charge in the inverted channel region needs to either be supplied when the transistor is turning on or, uh, or taken away when the channel is turning off. So that channel the charge has to go somewhere and um, it essentially typically flows to the source and drain regions and that effect is called charge injection. So I encourage you to do some practice problems uh, on this to sort of estimate how much charge is stored in the channel of a transistor of a given size. That can be calculated from the transistor's parameters and the voltages involved. And therefore, what's the impact of that charge being injected, for example, onto a capacitor here? Well, that will result in a change in the voltage across this capacitor when the charge from this channel gets dumped onto here. So these things can be estimated um, from the device parameters.